Yes, so it's been a while and I want to update you on. Last time I was here I talked about my research in the book Race Differences and Ethnocentrism and I talked about uh, Britishness and British uh, genius and British ethnocentrism and I want to update you on the research I've been doing uh, since then. Now we've had uh, two excellent speeches so far on, as it were, short-term history, history over the last 100 years or so. <clears throat> so I want to look at uh, the broader sweep of history, the broader sweep of uh, European and of world history over thousands of years, over thousands of years. So that's what I aim, aim to talk about. And uh, as, I, as I got here uh, yesterday, I flew in from Finland and I'd uh, arranged to meet a friend of mine, and it, it, this sort of got me thinking about this issue of history. I'd arranged to meet him at Waterloo Station, and I said, to, uh, well, where at Waterloo are you? And he said, um, I'm by the entrance near the KFC. <laughs> And uh, thank you. And uh, this, this irritated me. This irritated me for a number of reasons. Um, firstly, because he used the phrase KFC rather than Kentucky Fried Chicken. <laughs> and KFC was just another example of one of these Generation Z acronyms that proliferate all the time, like LMAO and LMFAO and all that. They can never just talk in sentences. Oh, I, right. Yeah. Oh, that's better. Oh God, yeah, right, hang on. Yes. Um, they can never just talk in sentences. It's always, it's always acronyms, it's always things like that. And secondly, because why did it have to be by the KFC? Why couldn't it be, why couldn't it be by the Green Man pub? Uh, by, by the Elephant and Castle pub? By something traditional in English? No, no, no. It had to be something global. <laughs> by, by, by the KFC. So I made my way to the entrance to Waterloo Station by the KFC. <laughs> and on my way there, on this wonderful station that was opened in the 1840s with its inspiring Victorian architecture and whatever, on my way there from the Waterloo East entrance to the entrance by the KFC, there was a statue, a statue I hadn't seen before at Waterloo Station, a statue that had been built that had been set up entirely to irritate me, entirely to make me feel like my people have been defeated and crushed, entirely to just get on my tits. And that statue was a statue of three West Indian immigrants, right by the entrance near the KFC, appropriately, <laughs> called the Windrush statue. And that upset me. And why did it upset me? Because we at Waterloo Station, at our second busiest terminus, at our main terminus in the UK, have put up a monument to our own defeat as a people. And what kind of people do that? Our own defeat as a people, a monument to the fact that we have allowed the biggest invasion since the Anglo-Saxons which we all are, we are all of us with a few exceptions perhaps in this room, 12th cousins, we are all of us have a common ancestor in about 1500 and yet these people who are, I mean they have brought many interesting things. But, uh, <laughs> but, they, but, uh, but they are of course not the same family. And it got me thinking, well, why would you do that? Why would you want to put up a statue to your own defeat? Why would you want to put, a statue, put up a statue which would demoralise every day a lot of uh, English people that would make their way to work, that would make their way to work and leave Waterloo Station via the entrance by the KFC um, uh, in, order, in, order, in, order to go to, in order to go to the Royal Festival Hall or wherever they happen to be working. Why would you want to demoralise them? Because we didn't used to do that. We didn't used to do that. As I was on the plane on the way here, full of Finnish people, we were flying over London and they were fascinated by the idea of going to London. You could see Buckingham Palace from the plane. You could see all kinds of things. You could see all kinds of things that had been put up to inspire the British people. And we have that even within this hotel. We have uh, paintings of Nelson within this hotel. We have a photograph over there of Bodicea. We have, a photo we have pictures of Wellington within this hotel, pictures of our kings, pictures that are meant to inspire us with great people, that are meant to remind us that we are a great people, that we are responsible for the Industrial Revolution, that we are the reason why there's basically everything 
everything. Uh, with a few exceptions um, uh, that, uh, that, that, uh, that, that is about. They were there to inspire us. And the buildings were there to inspire, it's inspire us. I was talking to somebody earlier about Poundbury in Dorset. And it's been deliberately built in this uh, old-fashioned looking way. And that's what people like. It makes them feel good. It makes them think of the past. It connects them to their ancient history. It makes them feel a sense of continuity. Which I'm afraid those bloody carbuncles near Richmond Park which were apparently, someone was telling me earlier, were put up deliberately to annoy the wealthy people that lived near Richmond Park, to block their view of the park. Do not. They do not inspire a sense of history and a sense of beauty and a sense of the transcendent. They inspire a sense of disgust. Why is it that our statues have to inspire, have to inspire a sense of, uh, of disgust and of defeat? Why is it that our art has to do so? Why is it that our adverts have to do so? What is it saying, to, what is it trying to say to British men when every time you see a TV commercial these days, it is a black man and a white woman. What is it trying to say? It's trying to say, defeat, defeat. You have been invaded, you have been overtaken, your women are engaging in uh, collaboration horizontal. Um, accept it, this is it, you're finished, it's over. It's about making people feel unhappy. Why is it that our school, our history, is not taught accurately? You can't even have, his let alone be writing history via history programmes, where they of course imply that, that uh, Robin Hood had in his band uh, uh, an Indian woman, or, 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 they, or, they, or, they, or they imply that when Neville Chamberlain went to Munich there was some Indian woman that was helping out, uh, or whatever. Uh, let, let alone history, even history documentaries now, I saw one where William the Conqueror apparently had a black servant. <laughs> I'm fairly sure when I was taught about the Battle of Hastings in 1989 by Mrs Gill, which is our class project, the Battle of Hastings, I don't remember that being mentioned. <laughs> and I'm fairly sure that had there been a black servant to William the Conqueror, I would have known about it. History can't be realistic. And even schools, um, schools in the, old, would it, in the past, they would have inspired us with their history. They would have inspired us with a history that told us that we were a great people on a great path, so feel good. Now it is the opposite. Um, and even schools, schools were supposed to put you on, I suppose, what you might call an evolutionarily adaptive roadmap of life. They were meant to set you up to say, uh, you need to be group-oriented, you need to put the good of the group before the good of the self, you need to suppress negative feelings and violence and, and aggressiveness and things like that in favour of positive feelings and in favour of cooperation and so on, um, and you know, ultimately you need to carry on the story of your people. But this has obviously all changed. And it's changed radically over the last, uh, well certainly within, within my lifetime, such that, as I say, the sole purpose of these things is to, I mean, it's not just that, it, uh, that they are not put, schools are not putting kids on the adaptive road map of life, it's that they are basically promoting antinatalism. They are basically indoctrinating children with an idea that you should feel guilty about breeding, you shouldn't breed. We have this idea now, climate strike, which is uh, women going on sex strike until the climate crisis is over. Admittedly, a lot of these women have blue hair and tattoos, and you, know, you wouldn't touch them even if you were really pissed. Well, perhaps if you were really pissed. If you were it really, I've always said before that I've always noticed at conferences like this of conservative people, of right-wing people, that there aren't many birds in this room, but those that are here are generally pretty cracking. And that is a major difference between traditionalist groups and left-wing groups. There's no blue-haired tattooed weirdos. <laughs> no. Um, so, why do they act in this way? Anti-natalism, and basically what we call dysphoria. Uh, we are, I'm afraid there are some religious people that don't like to accept this, but we are an animal. We are an advanced form of ape. And we are adapted to a specific kind of ecology, to a specific kind of world. As Robin Dunbar has noted, we are adapted to be around people, to basically Robin Dunbar's number, 150 people. We should be living in communities of approximately 150 people. And when you run schools that have about 150 people, or departments that have about 150 people, they operate better. Because that is our number. We have evolved most villages in medieval England, it's been calculated using the Doomsday book had about 150 people. And when they had more than that, they start to split up and you get 
other villages. It's the same with Amazonian tribes like the Alamama, about 150 people. That's our evolutionary match. Another evolutionary match is that we are with people to whom we are basically reasonably related. Not too related. Once you start having sex with your cousins, uh, then we get into a kind of West Virginia situation with the big-eared boys on farms and, and uh, funny teeth and all that kind of stuff. Not too interrelated, but not, not too unrelated. There has to be an optimum between the two. Um, we have to be living with people. Uh, it's been found, in fact, that when uh, people are shown photographs of those of a different race of them that they do not know, then the most primitive part of their brain reacts immediately without them even knowing it. Um, and this is because it is uh, with fear, because it is such an evolutionary uh, mismatch to be around people that are significantly genetically different. And if you put people in that kind of situation, then what you send them along is a dysphoria. And uh, dysphoria can make people act in a maladaptive way. It can make people not make people depressed. It can make people do uh, things that damage them, and ultimately it makes them not pass on their genes. And that is the ultimate question <clears throat> in terms of understanding history and in terms of understanding the future, because the future belongs to those who turn up. And uh, evolution is not something, you get some uh, pop psychologists <coughs> who like to say that, oh, evolution stopped on the savannah. No, it didn't. It sped up in the Holocene, um, and it is ongoing even now. Evolution is ongoing. So, um, how did evolution used to work, and how has evolution changed, and what effect is this happening, is, is, uh, is this causing to our nature? Well... Until the Industrial Revolution in 1800, or around about then, the child mortality rate was something in the region of 40 or 50 percent. So that meant that every generation, the weakest, as it were, were being purged from the population. Um, children would die of things like scarlet fever, they would die of things like measles, they would die of whatever, and only about 50% of the population attained adulthood. Um, and it wasn't even necessarily all of those who had children. Until about 1800, there was a positive, cor uh, a positive correlation between intelligence um, and how many children you had. And I've looked at this in my book, At Our Wits End, While We Becoming Less Intelligent and What It Means for the Future. We know that until that time, the uh, wealth is a, a correlate of intelligence. It correlates with intelligence at about 0.4. And the wealthier 50% of the population had double the completed fertility of the poorer 50% uh, of the English population, based on Paris records. Based on various traits that we can look at, uh, we know that basically intelligence under these harsh conditions, these harsh Darwinian conditions, where also from about 1300 onwards it was extremely cold, and uh, with the, the uh, mini cold period that you had, the more the minimum, um, there was intense selection for intelligence, and it meant that on various measures that we can trace across time, we can trace, for example, per capita major innovation across time. So the number of major innovations per million of population per year. And this starts to go up in about 1100, and it reaches a peak in about 1870, where we are selecting very strongly for intelligence, so people are becoming more intelligent across time, and we have more geniuses, we have more major innovations, and so eventually we have the breakthrough of the Industrial Revolution. We can also trace head size across time from representative samples of skulls. Head size is going up, and by the mid-Victorian period, people have very big heads. Why? Big heads, big brains, big brains, more intelligence. We have um, evidence of other, uh, there's other, uh, other uh, evidence as well that can be employed. Violence across time, uh, uh, all, all, uh, literacy across time, uh, numeracy across time. And all of these things are increasing as we become more intelligent. The crucible of evolution in that context is firstly, yeah, uh, childhood illness and whatever, but it's also intelligent. Intelligent people are able to accrue more resources. Intelligent people, therefore, are better able to have lots and lots of surviving children. So they do, so intelligence goes up. The second thing is that intelligence is part, it correlates with reaction times negatively. The more intelligent you are, the quicker your reaction times. Why? Because intelligence is a reflection of a fast functioning nervous system, of a high functioning nervous system. This is why intelligence it correlates with being physically ill. Basically, being physically ill is evidence of high mutational load. You have a high number of mutations, your body doesn't work properly, you get measles as a child, you can't fight it off, and you die.
Now, there would be a correlation between that high mutational load and having problems with the brain, and therefore slow functioning, and therefore low IQ, because the brain makes up about 80% of the genome, and so this means that uh, if you've got mutations of the body, you've sure as damn it got mutations of the mind, and so therefore what we were selecting out, when we were selecting out these people with typhus and whatever, was low IQ people. And this was one of the reasons why intelligence was going up across time um, for this period. Another thing we were selecting out, another correlation that we know exists, is between physical illness and mental illness. And this correlation exists at the genetic level. So as we were selecting out people over time who were physically ill, we were purging people who were mentally ill. Another thing which being mentally ill correlates with is basically what you would call individualism. If you're, if you're in an easy ecology, a very easy ecology in which there's not much selection pressure, then of course there's no selection towards being pro-social. There's no selection towards being mentally stable. There's no selection towards not being a narcissist or not being Machiavellian or being group oriented. So therefore these kinds of mental problems tend to correlate with those kinds of socially negative traits. So what one would predict would happen would be that as the child mortality rate collapsed from about 50% in 1800 to about 10% in 1880 to about 1% now, is there would be a massive rise in people who were mentally ill, a massive rise in people that were narcissistic, a massive rise in people that were depressed, a massive rise in people that were Machiavellian, a massive rise in basically individualistic, uh, selfish people. And eventually, what you would expect over time um, is that the, 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 the nature of the evolutionary pressure would change. And I think that's what happened. I think that I look at in my new book, The Past is a Future Country, The Coming Conservative Demographic Revolution, um, that the way that this change has occurred. So from about, in about the 1960s, it seems that we reached a tipping point. The changes don't happen slowly and gradually. Changes happen suddenly. We know there was a lot of research on this that you can make, you can literally persuade people to lie if about 20% of the group say that 2 plus 2 is 5, then a lot of people will migrate over very quickly to the view that 2 plus 2 is 5. You have a tipping point of about 20%. So I suggest that at about 20% of the population, being these people that would, have, uh, that would be highly individualistically oriented, that would be high in mental instability, that would, whatever, then there would have been a tipping point over from a society that was group oriented. We have these five moral foundations. Uh, if you may be familiar with Jonathan Haidt, five moral foundations. Uh, these are group oriented foundations uh, of uh, uh, in group loyalty, of obedience to authority, and of sanctity. sanctity to be discussed, and the disgust is adaptive so that you keep things that are bad for your group out of your group because you regard them as disgusting. Um, and then you have individually oriented foundations, that is to say, um, harm avoidance and equality. Now, we, we are pack animals, and so the result of that is that you have to have both. You have to have the group-oriented foundation so that your group can fight other groups successfully, but you also have to have the individually-oriented foundations um, so that you can ascend the, the ladder of the group, as it were, ascend the hierarchy of the group. Because remember, that until recently, there was a strong relationship between being high in social status and passing on your genes. I mean, remember, women will sexually select for high-status men. I mean, this is well known, and we're more likely to get them if they are dangerously thin. Um, now, if you, if you, so you, this is this is always the way, the way of things, and we always have this balance between the two, between the two sets of foundations. Now, what's been found is that people that are conservative, they are about equal in all five moral foundations, i.e., they are adapted to the general situation. People that are uh, liberal are very high in the individually oriented foundations. <clears throat> and very low in the group-oriented foundations. Now, this is, uh, this, what this means is because being liberal, there's a lot of research by Emil, who you'll hear from later, uh, which has demonstrated this correlation between mental illness uh, and being left-wing, uh, it means that if you are high in neuroticism, if you're high in, in negative feelings, basically, uh, then you will see the world as a dangerous place, and, and therefore you will be out for yourself and you will want to look after yourself only. And the way you can look after yourself only is by being concerned about these individually oriented values. But you also want to get status so you can get power over people. How do you do that? Well, you pretend you're interested in equality, you pretend you're interested in harm avoidance, but you engage in a kind of covert play for status. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and then, and then you, you, you get to the top that way. Now the problem with that is it means that there is asymmetrical empathy. It means that right-wing people can sympathise with left-wing people. We care about equality. We care about harm avoidance. You know, if, we, if, we, if we see some poor child unhappy in the street, we'll go and help it. You know, we care, um, but they don't care about the things we care about. So we'll always give ground to them. 
And what this means is that eventually you get this tipping point, and then I think this happened in the 60s, where we tip over towards no longer being concerned about group-oriented values, which is what we were brought up on, group-oriented values. We had an education system that instills in you this idea that you need to be concerned about the good of the group, the good of society, the good of everybody else. You need to be pro-social. If you have anti-social ideas, I mean, if you are, let's say, I'm thinking back when I was at school in the 80s, I, if I had asserted that I feel like I'm a girl, <laughs> and I, I, I want to go to the girls' loo. I remember the, the first time we went swimming, we had swimming uh, uh, in 1989, and they put us in these mixed changing rooms. And a lot of us were very embarrassed about this. We'd never been in the mixed changing, you know, a, a, a changing room where, the, where you're not on your own in a cubicle kind of thing. In Finland, of course, that's totally normal, indeed compulsory. And it would be considered strange if you didn't want to do that. But in, in England, no, no, we didn't like being naked in front of each other. If I had said, look, Miss, or I ident Miss Gill, Mrs. Gill, I identify as a girl, I want to go in the girls' changing rooms with the, with the vajayjays and the nascent titties. Um, then it strikes me that she might have been unhappy about that fact. And, and it, it strikes me that the girls may have rebelled and said, look, we don't want Ed in our changing room looking at our vajayjays and, uh, and nascent titties. <coughs> And, uh, and that would have been a very reasonable point for them to make. But no, now, now, if, if, the, if, the, me, if the me of, of 2022 says he wants to go in, a, in, a, in the girls' changing room and look at their bits, then that is perfectly acceptable. And it is wrong to say that it's a pro it is bad. It's basically like racism. It's, you're a Nazi to say that's wrong. But that's not enough. It's not enough. It's not just that they, they get to do that. They've got children now identifying as cats. <laughs> if I wanted to go down the alleyway at the back of my parents' house, <laughs> where two cats engage in sexual intercourse, I don't know, you've all heard of doggy style sex. There's also moggy style. It's, um, it's, it's, two, it's two people that don't particularly like each other very much, that have sex in your garden about three o'clock in the morning. <laughs> Correlates with a lot of screaming and hissing, and is eventually ended by a bucket of water being thrown over them. If you ever engage in moggy style sex, and uh, you will of course find that the, the man will find, as he withdraws, that his penis has barbs on it, which cause the cat to ovulate, and that's why the cat turns around and scratches him. But anyway, if you identify as that, this is this is of course the problem. So what this means is that school is no longer putting you on an adaptive roadmap of life. It is putting you on a maladaptive roadmap of life. It is telling you to do things which will damage you. And this is, I mean, even when I was at university, this was very basic um, uh, 20 years ago. We had all been told girls and boys are equal, which they're not. I'm not saying they're, you know, women are better than men or men are better than women. Well, okay, I am saying that. But on, 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 on certain measures, men are better than women, uh, such as intelligence. Uh, or, or such as genius, and on certain measures women are better than men, such as artistry and things like this. Um, but, but, you know, the, we have been told it's okay for men to express their emotions and whatever, but it isn't. And you, and you soon learn when you go to university that there's nothing more repellent to girls than men going around saying how they feel. Now that's a very minor example of the way in which school 20 years ago had not put us on the adaptive roadmap of life. So think what it's doing now with the runaway individualism that we have. Runaway individualism means that you signal individualistic foundations, you signal equality, you signal harm avoidance. And, and the problem with it is that the nature of intelligence is highly conformist. There's a number of studies on this. Intelligent people tend to conform. They tend to look around the world and they tend to notice that which is the, the current thing, that which is the current world view. And they have the uh, impulse control, the effortful control. <clears throat> to imbibe that worldview, to convince themselves of the veracity of that worldview, and then to advocate that worldview in a, in a system of one-upmanship, such that they are signalling it slightly more than the last man. So what you get then is a situation, first of all, in the 60s, people are against sexism and whatever, and then once sexism is totally unacceptable, everyone's against racism, and then once racism is totally out, then everyone's against, everyone's in favour of homosexuality and whatever, and then once that, then we get transsexuality that we have now, and eventually, of course, I mean, we know it's happening, the next thing will be maps. 
The next thing is going to be minor attracted persons and the rights of paedophiles um, to, 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 to express their sexuality, to have map this. But there was a book by, by some transsexual woman, I think it was called A Long Dark Shadow, in which she advocated exactly this. She said that we, we need to have maps represented in films. We need to have maps represented in Hollywood. We need to have positive map role models so that maps don't feel left out. And that's what you get with runaway individualism. You, you get this insanity such that society is increasingly a dysphoric. Society is increasingly, it's just sort of hell for people. Society is increasing, it, it just makes you feel bad. And that is then a new crucible of evolution. The crucible of evolution has changed from child mortality which selected out 50% of people every generation based on their genetic qualities to wokeness. And if you can resist wokeness, then you will have life. And if you cannot resist wokeness, then you will die. And your genes will die. Wokeness is the new crucible of evolution. That is what we are currently confronted with. And that is what the schools are currently doing. Um, so therefore, who is uh, being selected out by wokeness? Well, according to our research, the first issue is simply intelligent people. So intelligent people are more environmentally sensitive. There is some evidence for this. They are, they are more plastic in their psychology. They are more subject to their environment. Now, if this is the case, then if you are placed in an evolutionary mismatch and you are highly intelligent, then you are more likely to experience a sense of dysphoria, you are more likely to experience a sense of depression, and you are more likely to, not, to want to not have children. And we know this is happening. There is a correlation, a weak correlation, but nevertheless it is there, between intelligence and not just not having children. That's definitely there. I mean, the only, if you look at groups, uh, if you compare groups where uh, uh, both parents are working, which is an average IQ of 100 in the UK, uh, groups where one parent is on welfare, average IQ of let's say 90, uh, groups where both parents are on welfare, average IQ of let's say 85, and groups where both parents are on welfare and there's involvement from the criminal, you know, the police and social workers and whatever, only that latter group has above replacement fertility. So it's, it's, it's very low IQ people that are breeding. Why? Well, because they are not environmentally sensitive, they are highly instinctive, and they have therefore a high instinct to have sex, um, they and not, and not use contraception, they're too impulsive to use contraception, they're too stupid to successfully use contraception. I mean, I don't know if anyone, I don't know if any woman in here is on the pill, but um, you, you, you can't just take that, you've got to take that at the same time every day, religiously. You can't just knock it back with a glass of wine when you feel like it. It doesn't work like that. So, so this is, these things are relatively complicated, and therefore they get pregnant. And the second thing is there is some evidence that people do have a sort of instinct to want children. Some people dispute this. They say, no, this is not the case. But there is some evidence of women having baby fever, uh, women having a very strong desire to be pregnant. And of course you can see how that would be highly evolutionarily adaptive once we worked out from looking at mice or birds or dogs or whatever that sex is associated with having babies which would presumably a very ancient humans did work that out um, then once that happens then obviously it's adaptive to want to have children but more intelligent people um, do not want to have children they are more environmentally sensitive so what this means is that there, for those two reasons there is a negative relationship we are losing IQ uh, and we are losing somewhere in the region well it, it's been calculated based on our research that if our IQ is now 100, it will be 85 by the end of the century. Um, 85, 15 IQ points, uh, that is the difference between, let's say, a, a, science, a, a science professor and a high school science teacher, or a high school science teacher and a policeman, or a policeman and a low-level security guard, or a low-level security guard and one of these people that has lots of children that's permanently on the dock. That's the kind of difference we're talking about. 85, 100 is the IQ of British people, average native British people. 85 is the average IQ of African Americans. So the native IQ will be that by the end of the century. And this is because intelligent people are more environmentally sensitive and more sucked in by this dysphoria. This dysphoria that we see all around us, that is attempting to disgust us, that is attempting to make us feel that we are in an evolutionary mismatch, which we are, which is making us unhappy. Another issue, and this is something that I've only come across recently, uh, Professor Robin Fox, who some of you may be familiar with, has done some research on this, is if we're going to have a theory of why populations collapse, then a more parsimonious theory has to take into account why other animals collapse. And it's been found that all animals, uh, all sets of animals that we know of, go through these population fluctuations. 
And what it seems to be based around is optimal inbreeding and outbreeding. So well, this is found in mice, it's been found in voles, it's been found in fish, it's been found in a fruit fly, it's been found in all kinds of animals that you get the situation where the animals breed until the level of kinship between the animals, or the two random animals, is not very high. And then they stop breeding. They, why do they stop breeding? Because they don't want to have sex with people that are too genetically dissimilar from them. And they can't, they literally are infertile to a greater extent with people that are genetically dissimilar from them. And this has also been found uh, among humans. So there was a study in Iceland, for example, which showed that uh, sex between cousins, sex between second cousins, sex between third cousins and fourth cousins, that's the most optimal for pregnancy and children and whatever, and then fifth cousin, sixth cousin, so it starts to go down. The optimum is to have sex with your third cousin or equivalent, which makes sense because your third cousin is the border of your family. I mean, every, a lot of people, a few of you will know perhaps who your second cousins are, but unless you're aristocrats or something, you're unlikely to know who most of your third cousins are. So it makes sense that that's it. There was a study in Denmark which found something similar about fifth cousins in the case of Denmark was the optimum. Um, and so uh, it, what it implies is that you know, yes, you get everyone knows about outbreeding vigor. Everyone knows about this idea that you get these, these sexy mixed race people that are really good looking and whatever. That's, no, that, is, that is demonstrably true. They are they're, they're less likely to have high uh, levels of double doses and so they, they're better looking. But you also get the opposite. You get outbreeding depression. And so there is this optimum that seems to be selected for and you get this as well in humans. I mean, it's been shown that one of the problems with uh, infertility is higher among mixed race unions than among endogamous unions. Infertility is higher among mixed ethnic unions than among endogamous unions. Um, and there was genetic research, there was research that indicated that the um, that woman's immune system will destroy sperm to a greater extent if they are mismatched in terms of their immune systems because they are too genetically different. So that could be the, uh, the ultimate cause, that could be the, the deeper cause, if you like, of why populations must always rise and fall. <coughs> <clears throat> but if they become too outbred, they become too infertile, and they absolutely die. So that can't happen, and it won't happen. Because, because uh, as we become too large as a polity, we become more and more outbred. People don't want to have people don't want to have sex with people that are different from them. People can't get pregnant by people that are different from them, and so therefore the population always must collapse. Always. Um, the second uh, reason why it always must collapse then is that intelligence underpins population. All of the the important elements of population, whether it's a, a drainage system, whether it's um, you know, uh, enough food, the, the ability basically for, the popu for population growth uh, to um, not to outpace uh, production and the ability to produce things, it's all underpinned by intelligence. But as we become more intelligent and we produce this increasing evolutionary mismatch, where people are more different from us, where we are no longer living in our lovely Dunbarian 150 people, uh, where people are not our third cousins, uh, then eventually we have this dysphoria, it's more likely to happen among intelligent people, and so eventually there is inevitably um, some sort of collapse, and down we go. A third reason then, a downstream of this, is that as we have a larger population and we have weaker Darwinian selection pressures, we get more and more just mutant weirdos. Just more and more of appalling people um, as, uh, who, who, will ins who will make us feel depressed, who will spread their depression to us. There's a high environmental component for depression. If you meet other depressed people, you become depressed. And who will inspire us to do maladaptive things. As you may know, a, a concept, well, I didn't, I didn't uh, uh, coin this. It was uh, William Hamilton that coined the concept of the spiteful mutant. Um, and as we have more and more of these uh, people who, are, who would have died under harsh Darwinian conditions, who would be dead as children, or whose parents would be dead as children, or whose grandparents would be dead as children, they are likely to advocate spiteful ideas, ideas which push other people in a maladaptive direction. And you, know, you can normally, these days, increasingly, I find, with runaway individuals, you can tell who they are. I mean, you can just look at them. They have blue hair. They have purple hair. They have unnatural coloured hair. They have large numbers of tattoos. They definitely don't dress in tweed suits and nice ties. Um, and, 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 and with possibly a few exceptions, there aren't many of them in this room today. So those are the kind of people that we have to, we have to be uh, concerned about. I mean, it really puts us in mind of speciation. And that's what Robin Fox argued, that what you get as you, as you move further and further away from this kinship among the group is a, a movement towards speciation. And obviously at its extreme, the two alleles in speciation do not recognise each other. 
And, uh, but there's no hard and fast essentialist border. It's just that as you move further towards speciation, recognition is less, and so infertility becomes higher. And you can see this, I think, with these spiteful mutants. It is not normal to have blue hair. It is not normal to have red hair. What you are signalling to people is, uh, in, in nature, of course, you have this with wasps and other brightly coloured animals, what you are signalling to people is, stay away. Stay away. I am dangerous. I am violent. I am poisonous. I am going to hurt you. And there is a degree to which that's true. Although, to be fair, there is evidence that uh, left-wing men are lower in testosterone than right-wing men and are physically weaker and whatever and, and uglier. So actually, it's not like what it's... it's, it's um, it's more like hoverflies. You know those hoverflies you, you, get, you get when you go by a river and they look like wasps? And you think, oh shit, it's a wasp. Oh god, no, no. But it's not, it's a hoverfly. It just looks like a wasp. That's what we are. We have an invasion of hoverflies. We have a society that has been taken over by hoverflies. But what is likely to happen, based on what has happened before, is eventually there will be a return to kinship. There will be, uh, a, 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 the, who is breeding? It's two kinds of people. It's the low IQ people that's going to lead to collapse and hell and whatever. But as, when you um, look at the highest quartile uh, of intelligent people, so if you look just at the very intelligent people, then what we find is the major predictor of sterility is being liberal. Highly intelligent liberal people are not breeding. It's, it, it's, it's the great steriliser. What? It's a good thing, it is a good thing. It's the great sterilizer. Whereas highly intelligent conservative people, uh, highly intelligent religious people, and the, heritage, the genetic component of these traits is quite high, it's about 0.6, they are breeding uh, heavily. So you have two kinds of people that are breeding, a divide, the very stupid, who will, will, will just basically create a third worldization of the West. Someone was telling me earlier that they were in Gloucester, and they couldn't believe how ghastly Gloucester was. Well, yeah, that's a low IQ kind of place. So that's, that's the kind of future that we're talking about. Um, um, and then on the other hand, uh, highly intelligent religious people. Now what you would expect, and what always happens in the winter of civilization, and on every measure, if you've read John Glubb's book on this, on the decline of empires, John Glubb's book, Pasha Glubb, um, every, it's, it's the same. Every time civilization falls, it's the same. You, it's uh, the, the rise in feminism, the, the, the religion collapses, the rise in women in power, the rise in homosexuality, the rise in transsexuality. And let's not forget, Nero had a transsexual wife. Uh, or a husband, whatever, and that was towards the end. Uh, you, it, a rise in immigration, a rise in multiculturalism, it's always the same. And eventually a subgroup breaks up. Now, civilization didn't die last time. It didn't die, it just shrank. And it shrank into a kind of neo Byzantium, into a wait, literal Byzantium, where intelligent, to which intelligent people from the Dark Ages escaped. In the 1060s, a group of 300 ships after we'd been invaded by William the Conqueror, 300 Anglo-Saxon ships, full of our notables, left the country and made their way uh, eventually to Byzantium, and then set up Nova Anglia in what is now Ukraine. So that is the kind of thing we would expect. We would expect the highly intelligent conservative types to escape from the civilizational declension and set up a kind of Neo-Byzantium. And so that, I think, is the future of England. Our ancestors came here from about 410 onwards in the last collapse of civilization, escaping from the cold, escaping from whatever, and they set up a great civilization. They have now outbred to too great an extent. They have now become mutated. They have now engaged in speciation. But you will have to have the rump, the core of Englishness, the flower of the English, people like us. <laughs> who will need to get together, band together, and keep the flame of civilization going yeah. in the hate of this global homo. Thank you very much.